that's what we're busy doing. We're singing with angels and all of creation, saying, Jesus, it's all about you. You are the main character of the story. You are the main plot of the storyline. You are the center of the universe. And you are the center of my life. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're so welcome. Thank you. Just before I start, uh, so Danelle, Brent's wife, she just felt a word in her heart. And so this might be specifically for you. And so I share it gladly. Uh, she just felt these words of uh, uncertainty and certainty that in a time of uncertainty, God is the only certain thing that you can hold on to. So that's maybe something specifically that you need to hear. If you're going through a time of uncertainty, God is the certainty that you long for. So hold on to God. So this morning, I want to quickly um, do a bit of a thought experiment with you. So quickly imagine for a moment that you were to gather around the smartest minds in the world, the cleverest people in the world. So you gather, uh, you know, the best historians, the best economic experts, the best military strategists. Um, you even gather the best social media marketers in the world, uh, people that really know how to market things, you gather them and you make up this committee and then you tell this committee of yours, you have got a goal. I've got a goal. My goal is to become the most influential and famous person to ever walk this planet. I want thousands of years from now, civilizations to be built around my teachings and uh, thousands of years from now that people's lives would literally revolve around me. I want to be that famous and that influential. And uh, just imagine for a moment that this comedy would entertain your thoughts and they won't think that you're crazy. Um, and then what would be the advice that they would give you, would you think? What would be the best strategy to become the most influential and famous person to ever walk this planet? Would it sound at all anything like this? Well, firstly, be born in obscurity in a little town in a nation that's not really important on the global scale. And then avoid getting involved in any powerful political or economic or academic networks. Don't enlist for the army or anything like that. Don't get involved in any influential networks in the world. Then get tragically killed in your early 30s before you ever written a book. And that's how you become the most influential person ever. Th that's not the advice that they'll probably give you. That's not the kind of advice that the world will give you if you want to become great and experience glory. Yet that is exactly how Jesus did it. He's got the name above every other name, and that's his life story. You see, uh, this morning we're thinking about the cross of Jesus and the grave of Jesus. Now, when we consider the cross and the grave, at that moment when people were looking at Jesus on the cross and, and going into the grave, they saw an utter failure. They thought that this is horrific failure. All of his followers abandoned him, denied him. And he was even rejected by God. You see, being crucified, hanging on a tree like the Old Testament, uh, you know, depicted, was a curse from God. So the religious people looked at Jesus hanging on the cross and saying, surely this man is cursed from God. Cursed by God, abandoned by his followers. He didn't set up a school of thought like Plato or Aristotle did that he left behind. He didn't rise an empire like Alexander the Great or the Roman Empire, anything like that. Yet God worked in an upside-down manner. God loves working in upside-down ways. You see, Scripture tells us, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. What we consider failure is actually glory for God. What we consider foolishness is sometimes the wisdom of God, not only in the life of Jesus, but this morning I want to argue in your life also. You know those moments where we are sometimes in life, we look up and we say, God, where are you in all of this? That's what Jesus was doing, was looking up at the Father saying, Father, why have you forsaken me? Where is God in all of this? This is foolishness what's happening. Yet it was the wisdom of God. You see, today... Literally today, Good Friday, around the world, mi millions of people are gathering today in homes and in buildings like this 
and they are sitting around, not the latest TED Talk or s discussing Plato or Aristotle. They are sitting around the words and the works of Jesus. Millions of people today are building their lives, centering their lives around the words of Jesus. God works in an upside-down way. Now, as we think about the cross and the grave, uh, I want to just quickly this morning talk about the fact that this cross and the grave of Jesus, it brings us comfort in the fact that it is our salvation, it's the forgiveness of our sin, it's the victory over death for us that comforts us. But at the same time, secondly, it also confronts us in a deep way. And the second part is the part that we don't like speaking about as the Easter always. But it confronts us in a very, very real way, the cross and the death of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is not only our Savior, He is also our Lord. Jesus is Savior and Lord. And you know what Jesus says? I'll, I'll just put it in his words. I'll, I'll just read his own words. He puts it very bluntly in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So when Jesus says, be like me, he means die like me. <laughs> Pick up your cross, embrace your grave, and follow me into death. Because that's where the true glory of God lies, on the other side of death. So, we love the fact that God chooses in an upside-down way. So, the way that the world chooses, you know, the influential people, is we, we look at the rich people, the famous people, the intellectual people, the influential, like just, you know, the popular people in society, and we choose them. God, on the other hand, doesn't choose the beautiful and the intellectual and the popular he chooses the lonely and the outcast. He chooses sinners. He chooses normal people like you and I. And so when we read the stories from Genesis straight through into the New Testament, the disciples of Jesus, people that Jesus used, we see men and women just like you and me with lots of mistakes, average people like you and me. That gives us lots of hope. And we love that part of the story because we love a story where the underdog wins. And we associate with that story. We see ourselves in that story. But you know what part we don't like in this upside-down way in which God works? Is we know that God chooses us, but we don't like the fact that sometimes God will choose an upside-down storyline for your life also. You see, the kind of gospel that we like is the, the gospel where God chooses the underdog, that's me, and then God gives me my big break. And then I live happily ever after and become successful and famous. <laughs> but that didn't happen for Jesus. He died. If we read the storylines in the Bible, it's an upside down kind of storyline. Abraham didn't see the promises being fulfilled. Joseph, although it ended well in the end, you know how many deaths he had to die, the cross that he had to carry, how many times in prison, years and years, looking up to heaven saying, God, what about those promises that you made? This is foolishness. This makes no sense at all, yet it was the wisdom of God. The same with the storyline of Israel. It's an upside-down kind of storyline. It's not the Hollywood movie. The same with Job. The same with Jesus. The same with every disciple of Jesus. You see, Scripture does not teach us, if you follow Jesus, everything will go well in your life. <laughs> it teaches us, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and die like I all of the disciples died for the name of Jesus. <laughs> it's not the Hollywood ending, right? Maybe that's the invitation to us. You see, in the gospel, I call this gospel the, the pretty woman gospel. Uh, I don't know if you've ever, I, I see a lot of young folks here. I don't know if you've ever watched the movie Pretty Woman, played by Julia Roberts and Richard Gere. It's an old movie, a bit of an age restriction, so married couples, you can go watch it. The other ones, you can just wait. But it's a story about Julia Roberts, who is a prostitute. And then there's this millionaire, played by Richard Gere. He spots this lady and realizes that she's special. And he gives her her big break. And her life radically changes, and her life finally begins. Now, that's the kind of gospel that we like. This God that will come and see, okay, now I'm actually special. He gives me my big break, and then I become special. Jesus didn't get that kind of break. 
kind of break Jesus got was he was broken. Sometimes the kind of break that God wants to give you for the glory of God is in some ways to break you. Now, just bear with me. I know that sounds wrong. But scripture teaches us in uh, Philippians 2 verse 5, and this is where the glory of God is discovered. Verse 5, it says, Have this mind among you. So meaning, this is applicable to us. Not only to Jesus' story, but to all of us. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He let go of himself. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Jesus died willingly. He he could have said no to the cross. Jesus went willingly because he felt the Father was leading him in that direction. He surrendered to death. He could have walked away. But he didn't. Even death on a cross, which was a curse. Therefore, because of this, so you see this surrendering, letting go, saying, Father, not my will, but your will. I'm going to get out of the way so that you are the main character of the story. Jesus got out of the way so that the Father's will could take place. And that's the life he's actually calling us to. And then what happens? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the glory of God in the life of Jesus was on the other side of surrendering himself. It was on the other side of emptying himself. It was on the other side of entrusting himself to God, saying, God, I commit my life literally into your hands. Glory was on the other side of death. I want to challenge you this morning, friends. Your life is no different. I know what you guys are thinking. This Good Friday sermon sucks. This is depressing. (laughs) The glory of God is on the other side of you. It's after you've surrendered and you let go, you die to the self. That's where the glory of God starts in your life and where you start being used for the glory of God in our city also. So so does it mean that God is this evil kind of God that just wants to hurt you and break you? No, here's the thing. God loves you and he is good. He is so good. But here's the thing that God knows about you that you don't always believe about yourself. Your biggest hindrance in life is you. The biggest thing that's holding you back in this life, to live a life of complete joy and peace to the glory of God. You know what's holding you back? It's you. And so God, because he loves you so much, he wants you to, in a sense, get over that. To empty yourself, surrender yourself to God. You see, once you give yourself over to God, fully surrender to God, you die to the self. You say, God, I just just trust you with my life. That's when life starts. And you realize you didn't lose anything at all. Giving away your life, Jesus says, then you actually find it. He who wants to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life will find it. That's what Jesus teaches. True peace and joy is on the other side of surrendering to God. That's what you're made for. It is the bargain of a lifetime, literally. It's the bargain of God. It's the best thing that you can do with your life is to give it away to God. To trust Him in that, just as Jesus did. And so that gives us hope because even when we think it's foolishness. So the reason I'm saying this, I know many of you are carrying a cross right now. Many of you are facing all kinds of graves in your life. And can I just encourage you? Maybe... There's nothing wrong. Maybe it's just the upside down storyline God is busy with. Maybe that difficult place, that place of uncertainty that you are in, it's not that, you know, God is not in it. It seems like foolishness, but it's maybe the wisdom of God. And so my encouragement to you is lean into it. 
if you are carrying a cross this morning, if you are facing death in your life, lean into it. Let go yourself into the hands of God. That's where your hope is. His certainty. And then secondly, let me end off by just explaining how His cross and His grave gives us comfort. You see, His cross and His grave wasn't His cross and His grave. It was your cross and your grave. There's this um, verse in Hebrews 2 verse 10 where it speaks about Jesus as our, the, the Greek word uh, for it is our archegon, our archegon. He is our chief leader and he is our prince. And it's the same language that gets used when it explains who David and Goliath was. Well-known story in the Old Testament. David and Goliath faces off with one another. The Old Testament called them a champion Goliath. And David was the champion chosen for Israel. And so what happens? They battle against one another. And whoever wins the battle, their nation is victorious. It gets imputed to them because they fight on behalf of their nation. That's what a champion is. If they lose, the whole nation loses. And so Jesus is our champion. He faces off against death. It's Jesus against death. And if I can just give you a bit of a vivid image. If you are facing a beast, an animal, maybe like a bear or a lion, and you want to kill it with a weapon, you shoot it with a gun, the bullet goes right into the animal and right through the back of that animal to kill it. If you kill it with a spear or with a knife, you drive it into that animal and through the back of it to kill it. In the same way, Jesus was the weapon of God. Our champion goes right into the heart of death. He gets buried in a grave. Only on the third day does he get uh, risen. So that no one wonders whether he was dead. He was fully dead. He goes into death. And he goes right through the back of death. And Jesus, yes, we can praise for that. Jesus, listen to this, Jesus kills death. Death dies at the hands of Jesus. That's how Jesus And that's a hope for us because it wasn't his cross. It was Abel's cross. It was your cross. He died for your sin. And his grave, your name is written on that grave. He went into your death, but he also went out of your death. And as he walked out of that grave, that grave has got your name on it. It's your victory for life. And so that's why we have hope. An eternal hope. Death, where is your sting? says the worst thing that can happen to you is you can die so what (laughs) you'll only be raised to greater glory you've got eternal hope because of the victory of Jesus but also right now as you are carrying your cross and dying many deaths will you trust God that the foolish that which looks like foolishness to you might just be the wisdom of God and as Jesus trusted God God knows he's busy with something bigger in his upside down storyline in your life. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And he is good to you. You can trust him. Give your life to him. Lord Jesus, we surrender ourselves to you. Give us the courage to keep on letting ourselves go, to pick up our cross, to follow you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Amen. I'm going to invite Eugene as he facilitates a time of communion for us.